unity prayer. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Be in my mind, Lord Jesus, be on my lips, and place your word in the depths of my heart. Amen. Amen. While Jesus was going through a field of grain on a Sabbath, his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands and eating them. Some Pharisees said, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them in reply, Have you not read what David did when he and those who were with him were hungry? How he went into the house of God, took the bread of offering, which only the priest could lawfully eat, ate of it, and shared it with his companions? Then he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Are we in love with God? Yes. And that's at the heart of our Christian journey, you know, is love. That we're in love with God and we have a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. It's an actual friendship. He, he knows you by name. He knows you by name. I remember once I was praying over a group of people at a homeless shelter in Boston. And we had had a, a mass there and then like a healing service afterwards. And I was praying over the, the um, people who worked there, the volunteers and the employees, but especially for those who were staying there as homeless men and women. And it's, it's fun to do a healing service. And I always get surprised too by what the Lord does. The most amazing things happen, especially like with the words of knowledge. So I'm, I'm praying over this young man, and I suppose he was 19 years old, and I'm praying over him, and his name tag, you know, it says, it says Michael. So and I'm praying, and the Lord, he says to me, um, his name is Joseph. And of course, me and my infinite wisdom, I correct the Lord and say, no, it says Michael <laughs> and my infinite eternal wisdom, you know? And he told me a second time, he says, no, he's, he's Joseph. And I said, well, it says Michael. And I was concerned. I wanted to call him, you know, by his name because some of the poor people in the homeless shelters are a little bit um, unbalanced, you might say, mentally. And I didn't want to provoke him, you know, to get upset or frightened, you know, by giving him the wrong name, maybe even get violent. So I want to be kind of careful there because some were having difficulties mentally. And the Lord whispered to me, you know, his name is Joseph. So I prayed over him and I didn't say it. I, I was afraid that he might go off ballistic. You know what I mean? Because he, he looked that way a little bit. And I finished the rest of the group. And when we got all done, uh, someone, uh, they came up to me one by one. We had some miracles that were happening. And that young man came up to me and I said, hey, Michael, how are you? He says, he says, good. I says, your name is Michael, right? He says, well, father, really? He said, um, everyone calls me Michael, but I found out just recently, I just found out, on my birth certificate, it says my name is Joseph. <laughs> he, the beautiful one, knows you by name. He knows us by name. Amen? Amen. And none of us are here by accident. No way, Jose, you're not here by accident. You are unique 
precious and unrepeatable. And he chose you to be here, and at this time too. We could have been born in another era or another age. He chose you to be born at this time. And you're part of his plan. Amen? I think that um, the first pope, today we're celebrating Pope Gregory, the, fo the first pope, Peter, he gives us an example, really what the popes are supposed to do, an example of this. When Jesus asked his disciples in the presence of the first Holy Father, who do people say that I am? And they had different answers, you know, like John the Baptist, you know, resurrected, and Elijah, one of the prophets. And then Simon Peter, the first pope, spoke up, and there was the first infallible statement by a holy father, the first infallible pronunciation. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Ooh, baby. The Holy Spirit moved right through the first pope, and he identified the Lord. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what does Jesus do then? He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. That was his real name. And Bar, of course, means son, so that means Simon, son of Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. No mere man has revealed this to you but my Father in heaven. I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. Amen? Amen? And they won't prevail now, by the way. The church is in a storm, and it seems like maybe the ship is about to sink, but the devil will not prevail. Amen? Amen. But notice what happened in that incredible dynamic when our Lord, like Socrates, was questioning his, his disciples. That's a good way to teach, is questioning your people, your students, who do people say that I am? And they all tried to answer. But Simon Peter identified the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what does Jesus do immediately? He identifies Peter! You gave me my name. You told me who I was correctly. Now I tell you who you are. You are no longer Simon. You are Pedro. You are Caiaphas. You are bolder. Notice what happens. He identifies Jesus. And so Jesus identifies him. That's how you find out who you are. Who am I? First, tell the Lord who he is. Confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Tell him who he is. Say, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Are you ready? Would you point now to the tabernacle? Everybody in the Holy Church, point your holy right finger to the tabernacle. <laughs> We're going to say this to him. We're going to identify the Lord. Say, I know, who you are. I know who you are. You are the Christ. You are the, Christ. The, Lord the, the Lord of the Sabbath. The Son of the living God. You are my friend. You are my Savior. You are the rock of ages. You are my love. You are my everything. Amen. Ooh, baby. Hallelujah. There is the pathway to knowing who you are. First tell Jesus who he is. And he will tell you who you are. Amen? Does it make sense? It's a biblical pattern. That's the way. Tell the Lord who he is, and he will tell you who you are. And it's so fun to find out who you are. You know what I mean? It's never what you think, by the way. It's never as boring as you think. You were meant to be a saint, and a saint among saints. Amen? No one halfway, no one average, no one mediocre, no one lukewarm. You were meant to be a saint among saints. Amen? Amen. There is room in heaven for all of us. Amen? Amen. For all of us to shine brightly. Alleluia. So if you're wondering who you are, you tell the Lord who he is. Then you wait for the answer. Amen? Amen. Now, beloved, 
I want to share with you a story that happened in my hometown in Tampa. How the Lord, the Son of the Living God, revealed himself to a young woman. She was a witch. And of all things, you know how we are, one of my friends fell in love with her. She was a wonderful girl. And one of my friends in Tampa fell in love with her. And I, can't, I can hardly blame him. She wasn't a black witch. She was a white witch. And I don't need to do with skin color. Uh, a black witch is someone who basically worships Lucifer, Satan. Uh, really satanic, you know, really naughty. A white witch is a different kind of witch. And that's a witch who uses the powers of the universe, so to speak, kind of new agey. The powers of the universe, like they go to a rose bush and try to draw the power out. It's also dangerous and it's condemned because they do not realize they're not evil and malicious like black witches. They try to help people, but they're unlocking powers that are not ours to unlock. And they don't realize that frequently they call upon evil spirits innocently without realizing that and bring horror sometimes. I mean, horror. So all witchcraft is forbidden. Amen? Yes. Just to keep us safe, that's all. We don't need witchcraft. Next time you meet a witch, bring her to Mary. We don't need any witch woman. We need the holy woman. Amen? Yes. They need Mary too. We don't need witches. We need Mary. Amen? Yes. And so my friend fell in love with her. She had a good heart. She had never been in a church before. Her family were like Protestant fundamentalists, but she really never went to church even with them. They weren't, they were like backsliders. They didn't go to church either. Never been in a Catholic church, are you kidding me? And so they decided they wanted to bring her to Jesus and let her come into a Catholic church and experience. And those who practice, you know, these kinds of things like new age movement and white witchcraft, they're not like evil to the core. They're sometimes it's misguided. And they have a very, like a sensitive spirit, very sensitive. They have to, to do that kind of quote unquote work. So my friends had the bright idea to bring this beautiful girl who he had fallen in love with into the Catholic church and one particular church in Tampa, my hometown. And one particular church there is called Mary Help of Christians Catholic Church in Tampa. And it's a Salesian church in school. And it's, it's like a basilica. It's quite beautiful. But in the back of the church, on that back corner, there is a room that's a reliquary. And they have mounted on the walls of this beautiful little or mid-sized chapel, in the back of the chapel, a several hundred relics of saints. That's always stupendous when you have that opportunity to be around the saints like that. They're like, like 200 plus, like first class relics, little bones of all these different saints. And I tell you, you can feel it. You go in there, whoa, there's something going on. And many people go there to pray and receive favors. So my friends were thinking, I think rather logically, since she's so sensitive to things, to bring her into the Catholic church and, and bring her back to the reliquary. And there with all of her sensitive nature, she would begin to feel all these saints like Martin de Porres and Rose of Lima and begin to be touched by holiness. Amen? It wasn't a bad idea. That's how, how teenagers think, you know what I mean? Not a bad idea. So the, the date was set and they brought her to Mary Help of Christians and the, they brought her in the front entrance and they wanted to see her reaction and begin this way to evangelize her. Begin this way to bring her into the gospel. And so this is what happened. The script didn't go quite as they planned. Does that sound familiar? They say the, the best way to make God laugh is tell him your plans. So man proposes and God disposes, amen? Hint, God's plan was better. So let me tell you what happened. Testing Ave Maria. 
And so they were in the back of the church here. The main doors were here. And my friends brought this beautiful young lady. They all, again, were very young. I'm guessing 18, 19, 20, 21. There's a group of five or six of them. And they come in, and they're going to bring her in. She's the first time ever in a Catholic church, first time ever. And they walk in, and they want to bring her now to the left, to the chapel back there. There's a small reliquary back there. So their plans are now to show her to bow, you know, to the Lord, and they go here. She didn't know what she was doing. But as she walked in, they, they're going to wait to move her. She stopped. And she said, no. And she pointed to that golden box on the back altar. What's that called? She'd never seen one in her life. She didn't know what it was called. And she began, she pointed to it. And they said, what's up, honey? And she pointed, she says, she said, oh, he's there. He's there. He's there. He's there. And they said, who? She said, God. God is there, isn't he? God is there. If a witch unconverted knows that, what about you and me? An unconverted witch walks in, points to the tabernacle for the first time in her life, and screams, he's there. The one she's been seeking in every little formula and prayer and ritual she did, the one she was seeking was there, is there now. Amen. Amen. What she was looking for, she found. Amen. Amen. He is there. Amen. Amen. Now you say it. Say, he's there. He's there. You're there. You're there. I, love you. I love you. You're the best. You're the best. I, believe I believe in you. May the whole world love you. Because you're there. Amen. So needless to say, she took her lessons, became Catholic, and they married in the Catholic Church. <laughs> Woo, baby! <laughs> Hallelujah! My littlest fan is over here. Praise the Lord. And so you see, there's another example where someone identified Christ Jesus. They identified the God-man. And God, in turn, identified her. She became a Catholic disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Alleluia. So what a treasure that we have in the Eucharist. Amen? Amen? Now, brothers and sisters, I won't go on much longer. How much time do you have? I'm starting to get excited now, but I don't want to get all of us in trouble. But let's look at this just for a moment. Just for a moment here. St. Paul writes, even if you should have countless guides to Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I became your father. Now, I want you to point that out to you, that remember another scripture verse where the Lord says, call no man on earth your father, and here is the infallible, inspired word of God calling a man father. Is that interesting? And it shows you the importance of rightly dividing the word of God. Amen? Understanding the word of scripture correctly. Amen? So when the Lord makes that injunction to us, his people, he's not talking about the word father. He spoke in Aramaic, after all. He didn't even use the word father. He spoke in another language. He's talking about making a God out of man. Like they do, for instance, I can speak this way because I'm Italian. Like they do among the mafia. And you have the Godfather. And you know, they almost worship him. I, know, I saw the mafia when I was growing up. They almost worship him. That's a perversion of fatherhood. Amen? We are fathers in the Father. We are fathers in the Father, not fathers replacing the Father. Amen? 
And so here is a very important thing to realize that the Bible doesn't say never to call a man your father in that way. St. Paul says very clearly, I have become your father in Christ Jesus. Amen? Well, Jesus, beloved, he actually made this statement at one time. Jesus said, I have come to gather for my father a people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. I've come to gather. Notice he didn't say, I've come to gather for myself. Rather, I've come to gather for my father a people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? And so what I want to slowly get around to is this. Satan, the Lucifer, whom I've had, quote unquote, the privilege to see face to face, in person. Satan hates fatherhood. He hates God the Father. He hates every true priest. And he hates daddies. Satan hates fatherhood. That's lesson 101 in spiritual warfare. Satan despises our father. And that's why he's worked concertedly for more than 100 years to destroy the Catholic Church and the priesthood through these scandals in particular. The priesthood was infiltrated. But to destroy marriage and the role of fathers in our families as well. Now it's become sinful to be a father. We're not allowed to be men. We must be wussies. <laughs> We're no longer allowed to be men of God. We have to be wussies. And that's why, for instance, I just need to be honest with you, the rise of homosexuality in the church and in the world. That's anti-fatherhood. That's anti-masculine, is it not? Yes. It's anti-fatherhood. That's part of Satan's diabolical plot because he hates the father. And you know how it is, like my mother told me when she was growing up, that her mother, my grandmother, so my mother's mother, um, I forgive me, but she hated her aunt. She hated an aunt in the family. And she would look at my mother and say, Oh, you remind me of aunt so-and-so. And she would say that to my mother and gave my mother a complex growing up. Because my mother looked like the aunt that my grandmother hated. We men look like the father that Satan hates. We look like God the Father. And Satan hates the fatherhood. He hates authority and discipline. Sound familiar? He hates authority and discipline. No matter how gentle it might be. And you want to realize that Satan's trying to destroy every last vestige of fatherhood in the country and in the land. He wants to destroy manhood and fatherhood. Amen? So that's very significant here when St. Paul is almost boasting, I am your father. Not be ashamed of me, I'm a wuss. No, I am your father. So we want to be aware that the battle in the world today is directed against God the Father in a particular way. Amen? But Jesus came to bring me to his father. And when you and I receive the body and blood of Jesus at Holy Mass, do you realize when we receive the Lord, we are also receiving the Father. Because what is the doctrine of the church? The infallible dogma. The three persons of the Holy Trinity can never be separated. Never. So if Jesus is there, guess who else is there? The Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so... I want to invite you today when you receive the body and blood, the great gift of God to the world, the gift that one day soon every Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist, and atheist also will be receiving with you and I. When you receive the body and blood of the God-man, realize today and open your heart and say, Father, I receive you too today. 
through Jesus and with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, why do I say that? Because it's precisely the Father who gives you your identity. We know this now from psychology. Did you know that a little tiny baby, a little tiny one, an infant, and one, two, three, and four years of age, do you know that children identify themselves completely with their mothers? So much so that a little child in his mother's arms, he or she, never sees himself or herself as separate from their mothers. They see themselves as one with their mother. It makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, in the womb, there in her arms. What is it that gives the little baby the gift of knowing who she or he is? It's precisely the voice of the father. We know this for a fact now. It's when the father calls the child by name and says, Hey, Jimmy, how are you? And Jimmy and mom looks. And dad, who calls mom, mom, now calls Jim, Jim. It's precisely the deeper authoritative voice of the father calling the child out of that circle with the mother into his or her own personality. Is that my little girl? How are you? And suddenly the little girl realizes she has dignity like her mother. She is a person as well. Did you realize that? It's the voice of the father that calls the children into their own identity. Now this plays into our religious faith, our Catholic faith. It is God the Father who calls you into your identity. He it is who speaks you into existence through Jesus. And when you go to Jesus, he will lead you to his Father. And the Father will tell you who you are. This is the reason why, beloved, we are living in an age of confusion where our children do not know who they are. Do you know why? Precisely and only because it's the father who tells the children who they are. And what happens if the father is missing? He may be there, but he never says, I love you. The children don't know who they are. Amen? Beloved, am I making any sense at all? This is part of Satan's plot against the world. But you and I are privileged to be here in the Holy Catholic Church at Holy Mass. We're going to ask the Lord to reveal to you and I who we are at Holy Communion and to reveal to our teenagers who they are. Amen? Hallelujah. Any questions, class? Let's go ahead and pray two Hail Marys, one for you and I that we will know who we are from Jesus and his Father. Then a second one for our teenagers. First for ourselves, we know who we are. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Remember, if you spend time in adoration, and we all should every week, there in quiet adoration, Jesus and his Father will speak to you. You tell him who he is. I've come to worship you, Jesus, Son of the living God, and Father, my Father. And then wait, he will tell you who you are. Listen for him in silence. Amen? Amen. Now a Hail Mary for our teenagers, those here but throughout North Carolina, that God would heal their father wounds and give them their identity so that every boy will be a boy and become a man of God and every girl will be a girl and become a woman of God. Amen? Amen. Let's ask Father, ooh, I just heard the demons scream. Seriously. 
Let's ask God to break through this confusion. It's a worldwide web of confusion to break through it and reveal to every teenage boy his masculinity and his destiny and to every teenage girl their femininity and their destiny. Amen? Amen. This is of God. Amen? Amen? Let's pray now for that breakthrough of identity from the Father himself. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The salvation of the just comes from the Lord. Amen.